This is Terry Bybo Knight, your reader. We're on chapter 16 of C.S. Lewis's The Last Battle. It's called Farewell to Shadowlands. If one could run without getting tired, I don't think one would often want to do anything else. But there might be special reasons for stopping, and it was a special reason which made Eustace presently shout, I say, steady, look what we're coming to. And well he might, for now they saw before them Cauldron Pool and beyond the pool, the high, unclimbable cliffs and pouring down the cliffs, thousands of tons of water every second, flashing like diamonds in some places and dark green glassy in others. The great waterfall, and already the thunder of it was in their ears. Don't stop, further up and further in, called Farsight, tilting his flight a little upwards. Well, it's all very well for him, said Eustace, but Jewel also cried out. Don't stop. Further up, further in. Take it in your stride. His voice could only just be heard above the roar of the water, but the next moment everyone saw that he'd plunged into the pool. And helter-skelter behind him with splash after splash, all the others did the same. The water was nice, not bitingly cold, as all of them, and especially Puzzle, expected, but of a delicious foamy coolness. They all found they were swimming straight for the waterfall itself. This is absolutely crazy, said Eustace to Edmund. I know, when yet, said Edmund. Isn't it wonderful, said Lucy. Have you noticed one can't feel afraid even if one wants to? Try it. By Jove, one can't, said Eustace after he had tried. Jewel reached the foot of the waterfall first, but Tyrion was only just behind him. Jill was last, so she could see the whole thing better than the others. She saw something white moving steadily up the face of the waterfall. That white thing was the unicorn. You couldn't tell whether he was swimming or climbing, but he moved on, higher and higher. The point of his horn divided the water just above his head, and it cascaded out in two rainbow-colored streams all round his shoulders. Just behind him came King Tyrion. He moved his arms and legs as if he were swimming, but he moved straight upwards, as if one could swim up a wall. What looked funniest was the dogs. During the gallop, they had not been at all out of breath, but now, as they swarmed and wiggled upwards, there was plenty of spluttering and sneezing among them. That was because they would keep on barking, and every time they barked, they got their mouths and noses full of water. But before Jill had time to notice all these things fully, she was going up the waterfall herself. It was the sort of thing that would have been quite impossible in our world. Even if you hadn't been drowned, you would have been smashed to pieces by the terrible weight of water against the countless jags of rock. But in that world, you could do it. You went on, up and up, with all kinds of reflected lights flashing at you from the water and all manner of colored stones flashing through it till it seemed as if you were climbing up light itself and always higher and higher till the sense of height would have terrified you if you could be terrified, but here it was only gloriously exciting." And then at last one came to the lovely smooth green curve in which the water poured over the top and found that one was out on the level river above the waterfall. The current was racing away behind you, but you were such a wonderful swimmer, you could make headway against it. Soon they were all on the bank, dripping but happy. A long valley opened ahead and great snow mountains, now much nearer, stood up against the sky. Further up and further in, cried Jewel, and instantly they were off again. They were out of Narnia now and up into the western wild, which neither Tyrion nor Peter nor even the eagle had ever seen before. But the Lord Diggory and Lady Polly had. Do you remember? Do you remember, they said, and said it in steady voices, too, without panting, though the whole party was now running faster than a narrow flies. What, Lord, said Tyrion, is it then true, as stories tell, that you two journeyed here on the very day the world was made? Yes, said Diggory, and it seems to me as if it were only yesterday. And on a flying horse, asked Tyrion, is that part true? Certainly, said Diggory, but the dogs barked faster, faster. So they ran faster and faster till it was more like flying than running, and even the eagle overhead was going no faster than they. And they went through winding valley after winding valley, and up the steep sides of hills, and faster than ever down the other sides, following the river, and sometimes crossing it, and skimming across mountain lakes as if they were living speedboats till at last at the far end of one long lake, which looked as blue as a turquoise, they saw a smooth green hill. Its sides were as steep as the sides of a pyramid, and round the very top of it ran a green wall, but above the wall rose the branches of trees whose leaves looked like silver and their fruit like gold. Further up and further in, roared the unicorn, and no one held back. 
They charged straight at the foot of the hill and then found themselves running up it almost as water from a broken wave runs up a rock out at the point of some bay. Though the slope was nearly as steep as the roof of a house and the grass was smooth as a bowling green, no one slipped. Only when they had reached the very top did they slow up. That was because they found themselves facing great golden gates. And for a moment, none of them was bold enough to try if the gates would open. They all felt just as they had felt about the fruit. Dare we? Is it right? Can it be meant for us? But while they were standing thus, a great horn, wonderfully loud and sweet, blew from somewhere inside that walled garden, and the gates swung open. Tyrion stood holding his breath and wondering who would come out. And what came out was the last thing he had expected. A little, sleek, bright-eyed, talking mouse with a red feather stuck in a circlet on its head and its left paw resting on a long sword. It bowed, a most beautiful bow, and said in its shrill voice, Welcome in the lion's name. Come further up and further in. Then Tyrion saw King Peter and King Edmund and Queen Lucy rush forward to kneel down and greet the mouse, and they all cried out, Reap a cheap! And Tyrion breathed fast with the sheer wonder of it, for now he knew that he was looking at one of the great heroes of Narnia, Reepicheep the Mouse, who had fought at the great Battle of Baruna and afterwards sailed to the world's end with King Caspian the Seafarer. But before he had had much time to think of this, he felt two strong arms thrown round about him and felt a bearded kiss on his cheeks and heard a well-remembered voice saying, What, lad, art thicker and taller since I last touched thee? It was his own father, the good King Erlian, but not as Tyrion had seen him last when they brought him home pale and wounded from his fight with the giant, nor even as Tyrion remembered him in his later years when he was a gray-headed warrior. This was his father, young and merry as he could just remember him from very early days, when he himself had been a little boy playing games with his father in the castle garden at Caerparavel, just before bedtime on summer evenings. The very smell of bread and milk he used to have for supper came back to him. Jewel thought to himself, I will leave them to talk for a little, and then I will go and greet the good king early, and many a bright apple did he give me when I was but a colt. But the next moment he had something else to think of, for out of the gateway there came a horse so mighty and noble that even a unicorn might feel shy in its presence, a great winged horse. It looked a moment at the Lord Diggory and the Lady Polly, and neighed out, What, cousins? Then they both shouted, Fledge! Good old Fledge! And they rushed to kiss it. But by now the mouse was again urging them to come in. So all of them passed in through the golden gates into the delicious smell that blew toward them out of that garden and into the cool mixture of sunlight and shadow under the trees, walking on springy turf that was all dotted with white flowers. The very first thing which struck everyone was that the place was far larger than it had seemed from the outside. But no one had time to think about that, for people were coming up to meet the newcomers from every direction. Everyone you had ever heard of, if you knew the history of those countries, seemed to be there. There was Glimfeather the Owl and Puddleglum the Marshwiggle, King Rillian the Disenchanted, his mother, the star's daughter, and his great father, Caspian himself. And close beside him were the Lord Drinian and the Lord Byrne and Trumpkin the Dwarf and Truffle Hunter the Good Badger, with Glenstorm the Centaur and a hundred other heroes of the Great War of Deliverance. And then from another side came Kor, the King of Archenland, with King Loon, his father, and his wife, Queen Erebus, and the brave Prince Corn Thunderfist, his brother, and Bree the horse, and Hwyn the mare. And then, which was a wonder be all all wonders to Tyrion, there came from further away in the past the two good beavers and Tumnus the fawn. And there was greeting and kissing and handshaking and old jokes revived. You've no idea how good an old joke sounds when you take it out again after a rest of five or six hundred years. And the whole company moved forward to the center of the orchard, where the phoenix sat in a tree and looked down upon them all. And at the foot of that tree were two thrones, and in those two thrones a king and queen so great and beautiful that everyone bowed down before them. And well they might, for these two were King Frank and Queen Helen, from whom all the most ancient kings of Narnia and Archland are descended. Tyrion felt as you would feel if you were brought before Adam and Eve in all their glory. About half an hour later, or it might have been half a hundred years later, for time there is not like time here, Lucy stood with her dear friend, her oldest Narnian friend, the Fawn Tumnus, looking down over the wall of that garden and seeing all Narnia spread out below. But when you looked down, you found that this hill was much higher than you'd thought. It sank down with shining cliffs, thousands of feet below them, and trees in that lower world looked no bigger than grains of green salt. Then she turned inward again and stood with her back to the wall and looked at the garden. I see, she said at last, thoughtfully. I see now. 
This garden is like the stable. It is far bigger inside than it was outside. Of course, daughter of Eve, said the fawn. The further up and the further in you go, the bigger everything gets. The inside is larger than the outside. Lucy looked hard at the garden and saw that it was not really a garden at all, but a whole world with its own rivers and woods and sea and mountains. But they were not strange. She knew them all. I see, she said. This is still Narnia, and more real and more beautiful than the Narnia down below, just as it was more real and more beautiful than the Narnia outside the stable door. I see, world within world, Narnia within Narnia. Yes, said Mr. Tomnus, like an onion, except that as you continue to go in and in, each circle is larger than the last. And Lucy looked this way and that, and soon found that a new and beautiful thing had happened to her. Whatever she looked at, however far away it might be, once she had fixed her eyes steadily on it, became quite clear and close, as if she were looking through a telescope. She could see the whole southern desert, and beyond it, the great city of Tashban. To the east, she could see Ker Paravel on the edge of the sea, in the very window of the room that had once been her own. And far out to sea, she could discover the islands, island after island, to the end of the world, and beyond the end, the huge mountain which they had called Aslan's country. But now she saw that it was part of a great chain of mountains which ringed round the whole world. In front of her, it seemed to come quite close. Then she looked to her left and saw that what she took to be a great bank of brightly colored cloud cut off from them by a gap. But she looked harder and saw that it was not a cloud at all, but a real land. And when she had fixed her eyes on one particular spot of it, she at once cried out, Peter, Edmund, come, look, quickly. And they came and looked, for their eyes also had become like hers. Why, exclaimed Peter, it's England, and that's the house itself, Professor Kirk's old home in the country where all our adventures began. I thought that house had been destroyed, said Edmund. So it was, said the fawn, but you are now looking at the England within England, with the real England, just as this is the real Narnia, and in that inner England no good thing is destroyed. Suddenly they shifted their eyes to another spot. And then Peter and Edmund and Lucy gasped with amazement and shouted out and began waving, for there they saw their own father and mother waving back at them across that great deep valley. It was like when you see people waving at you from the deck of a big ship when you're waiting on the quay to meet them. Well, how can we get at them, said Lucy. That's easy, said Mr. Tumnus. That country and this country, all the real countries, are only spurs jutting out from the great mountains of Aslan. We have only to walk along the ridge, upward and inward, until it joins on. And listen, there's King Frank's horn. We must all go up. Soon they found themselves all walking together, and a great bright procession it was, up toward the mountains higher than you could see in this world, even if they were there to be seen. But there was no snow on these mountains. There were forests and green slopes and sweet orchards and flashing waterfalls, one above the other, going up forever. And the land they were walking on grew narrower all the time, with a deep valley on each side, And across that valley, the land which was the real England grew nearer and nearer. The light ahead was growing stronger. Lucy saw that a great series of many-colored cliffs led up in front of them like a giant staircase. And then she forgot everything else because Aslan himself was coming, leaping down from cliff to cliff like a living cataract of power and beauty. And the very first person whom Aslan called to him was puzzled the donkey. You never saw a donkey look feebler and sillier than Puzzle did as he walked up to Aslan, and he looked beside Aslan as small as a kitten looks beside a St. Bernard. The lion bowed down his head and whispered something to Puzzle at which his long ears went down, but then he said something else at which the ears perked up again. The humans couldn't hear what he'd said either time. Then Aslan turned to them and said, You do not yet look so happy as I mean you to be. Lucy said, We're so afraid of being sent away, Aslan, and you've sent us back into our own world so often. No fear of that, said Aslan. Have you not guessed? Their hearts leaped, and a wild hope rose within them. There was a real railway accident, said Aslan softly. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. The holidays have begun, the dream has ended, and this is the morning. As he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories, and we can most truly say they all lived happily ever after. 
But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. And that is the end of chapter 16 and the end of the last battle. I hope you enjoyed it.